Hi, I'm Margot Seltzer. I'm honored to be here today, coming to you from Vancouver, British Columbia. The goal of my talk today is to convince you to take on exciting projects, projects that you think have potential, even if maybe some other people are telling you that they're kind of crazy. I want you to pick projects because they excite you and you can't imagine working on anything else, not because they're guaranteed to be successful or that it's what all the cool kids are doing. What do I mean by projects that maybe make other people think you're a little bit crazy? I'll begin by sharing some quotes from paper and or proposal reviews that I've gotten. This paper is nutty, but it's also very well done, reject. This is a thought provoking paper, though I would say it is a very, very far fetched one, reject. The paper is intriguing and made my heart skip a beat as I started reading it. I want every paper I write to make my reader's heart skip a beat as they start to read it. Unfortunately, that too was rejected. It is virtually impossible to simultaneously satisfy the requirements that the metadata be contained in the data and that the processing code be part of the provenance. Rejected. And my all-time favorite review, this idea is borderline crazy. Accepted. So sometimes, even if you take a wild and crazy idea and try to turn it into something real, you can actually get published in this community. Now, I am not the only one who feels that sometimes review committees are overly harsh. There's an entire website called strongreject.com run by Jin Yang. And to be honest, I didn't take this particular strong reject personally until recently. But the website is full with cute quips, some of which I am sure people have gotten on their reviews, although some of them are, in fact, perhaps a little far fetched. But even in the presence of strong reject, I want to encourage you to undertake the kind of research and write the kind of papers that make people gasp, that generate excitement, and that sometimes even infuriate them. One of my most Vivid recollections of an OSDI conference was one where Martin Renard gave the talk about failure oblivious computing because I'd never seen people leave a talk so angry. And I thought, I want to write papers that, that generate that kind of emotional reaction. The way I'm going to try to convince you of this is to tell a story in three parts. Part one will be a very biased, Margo-centric view of how our field has evolved. And I'm going to claim that the evolution of our field is one of the reasons why it's really hard and sometimes feels very lonely to take on these really bold and courageous projects. And then with that as background, I'm gonna talk about two different projects that I've undertaken that put me in positions where I genuinely felt like I was the fringe lunatic. So let's begin that journey. From where did our field come? And it really comes from a simple question, which is how do you build a mechanical computing device? And so at the very beginning, we had one big community that was computer systems. And I say we, I wasn't actually involved at that time. I'm old, but not that old. You know, and you had hardware and software and programming and programming languages were all one big happy family. And very early on, Hardware and software split up. Software tended to be more in the electrical engineering part of the room. Software was what we might think of as systems. But then of course, very, very early on, and I'm talking 60s, software split too. And we had programming languages, different community from operating systems, different community from databases. And if you look at my history, the difference between operating and systems and databases has always been very cloudy in my head. Now, the hardware folks also had their splits. Oddly enough, high performance computing kind of separated from what we now think of as computer architecture. And then we saw a lot more breaking up of communities. So operating systems used to be one big happy family, but then people said, well, there's networking and then there's distributed systems and those aren't necessarily the same communities. And about a millisecond after you introduce networking, well, then you start thinking about security. And then in a move that continues to baffle me to this day, databases kind of split into storage and databases. 
again, some of this is just too complicated for me to comprehend. Uh, scientific computing emerged its, its own thing so that we didn't have to worry about it? I don't know. And then in the most baffling split was when I was, it was explained to me that we needed networked systems and that somehow those were different from distributed systems. And that one baffles me to this day. Now it's not just the software side, the hardware side also split up in various ways. So mobile computing was sort of about mobile devices, but also maybe about mobile software. Then we had the emergence of things like embedded systems, which if you're a cool kid, you might call IoT today. And then of course, there's the real low level stuff, kind of the LSI that goes off into its own world. So we are left with this pretty splintered area that I like to think of as computer systems. And of course, because it's 2020, you can take any of those boxes, you can sprinkle machine learning pixie dust and you have yet more areas. I'm gonna claim that this decomposition is not serving us well. In fact, I think it's harming us. I think the most exciting work happens when you can draw in multiple of these boxes and figure out how to take techniques and mechanisms that have been developed in one area and apply them to another. So try to back that up. In the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk about two pretty different projects that I think have drawn on lots of these different areas in computer systems. I will leave it to you to decide if it's worthwhile, but you know, guess what? I'm gonna make the case that it was. So let's start with provenance aware storage systems, otherwise known as PaaS. In reality, this is really about whole system provenance capture. We didn't have that term at that point and PaaS was a cute acronym. So it is less about storage systems and more about whole systems. I traced the roots of this project back to 2001 when Peter Buneman and company wrote a paper explaining how you could answer really important questions in databases by maintaining the provenance or the history of where tuples came from. So let's back up a minute. What is provenance? So it comes from the art world. If I have a lovely Picasso to sell you, in fact, you would probably like some evidence that that painting is a genuine Picasso. And that evidence is called provenance. And it's a verified chain of ownership of a piece of art. In the data world, you can think of a similarly verified chain of ownership or record of processing of a piece of data that says like, where did this come from? And so what Peter and company did is they said, look, in a relational database, where data is produced essentially via very well-defined semantic queries expressed in relational algebra, then there are precise answers to what data provenance is. So given a query result, I can tell you where it came from in the database and why it appears in your query. So from my point of view, this was the beginning of digital provenance or data provenance. So a few years later, I was standing in the ground floor of Maxwell Dworkin, the computer science building at Harvard and chatting with Jim Waldo. And we were bemoaning the state of computational science and how difficult it was to reproduce things. And I had this aha moment. It was like, oh my God, we're systems people. We control the system. We should be able to figure out where data came from. And this was the birth of the PASS project. Others were taking a different approach. So Jennifer Widom's group at Stanford was building TRIO, which was a database that took Peter's concepts of data provenance and applied it to probabilistic databases where the absence or presence of data in your database was not a binary thing, but it was a probability distribution. And so when you took together two probabilistic values and produced a new one, you could use the history and their probabilities to figure out the probability of the next item. Finally, in 2006, the provenance community got together for something called the first international provenance and annotation workshop. And there were people there who said, we should standardize on what provenance looks like. And there were a few of us who said, excuse me, but no one's using provenance. And if they're not using provenance, how do we know how to describe it? And thus was born, and I did not organize this, the first provenance challenge. And this was a community effort whose goal 
was to figure out like how might we use provenance and therefore how should it be represented so we could come up with a standard that was actually actionable. So let me tell you a little bit about the first provenance challenge. Here was the workflow. This is a brain imaging workflow where you take a bunch of images and do some stuff. And most of the groups were in fact representing provenance at the level of a workflow. So their conception of the workflow looked a lot like this picture. And when you asked a query, they would produce a subset of this picture. We were systems people. We were gathering provenance at the layer of the operating system. So when we answered a query, we produced a picture that looked like that. And if you don't like the visual representation, we would be happy to provide to you the 106 kilobytes of text output. So what did people think? Well, they thought we were the fringe lunatics. Like, why do you want all that information? Who cares what the operating system is doing? You can't claim that's all useful. And like versioning, what's this versioning stuff? So one of the fundamental realizations we made about a millisecond after we started looking at this as a systems problem is that every time a new piece of provenance describes an object, you really have a new instance of that object or a new version. And everyone else would just create brand new objects that had no relationship to the other. And we said, no, 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 versions are actually really fundamental. But what was really going on here is that we were challenging the assumption that, that had been built in from day one, right? That database provenance was all about understanding the semantics of the data. And we were trying to make a claim that actually, even if you don't understand the semantics, it is useful to capture data at this level. So why did we think that? Well, because there are bugs that you can build as an application developer that don't manifest if all you know about are the semantics of your application. Right? So my favorite is when somebody installs a new library. Or a more timely example is last semester when every time I walked into class to teach with the exact same laptop on which I had installed no new software, Zoom behaved differently because my university kept changing all the default settings that everyone in our domain was using. So it was kind of like, ooh, I wonder what Zoom's going to look like today. Now, no amount of application provenance that I controlled was going to tell me that. So, so we were kind of challenging some fundamental assumptions. And so we were the fringe lunatics. And we happily remained that way. So in 2006, we released PASS version 1, which was a severely hacked up version of the Linux kernel that collected provenance. Now, in 2007, the second provenance challenge came along. And sure enough, we were going to play. So this one, the idea was you ran the workflow and collected provenance, then you handed your provenance to somebody else, and you took somebody else's provenance, and then you started trying to answer queries. So imagine those poor folks who got our 106 kilobytes of provenance and had to try to wade through it to answer queries. They didn't like us very much. But as we took other people's provenance, what we realized is that depending on where you capture provenance, you can answer different kinds of questions. Seems sort of obvious in retrospect. And more fundamentally, the key thing is that you need to be able to connect the provenance at these different layers so that you can actually answer queries that span the multiple layers. So this led to pass v2, which on one hand was much better architected than pass v1. On the other hand, it was still what I like to call grad student software, because that's who had written it. So its maintainability left something to be desired. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, a couple years later, we suddenly weren't the only fringe lunatics. So there was a group that decided that provenance was actually useful in tracking networking behavior. And they built secure network provenance. And that was really cool. And then in 2012, people had noticed that our code was totally unmaintainable. And they built Wi-Fi. This was a group from UPenn. And the whole idea there was to come up with a nice clean interface in the kernel that you could use to collect provenance in the hopes that this would be maintainable over a longer period of time. Unfortunately, it was their own interface. And so it too suffered from maintainability problems. And then finally, in 2017, Pasquier et al. from the University of Cambridge realized that the Linux security module interface provided exactly the right place 
to capture provenance and it was an interface that was going to be stable and supported. And so in my mind, this was a real game changer because we suddenly had a maintainable system. And this has now been ported over dozens of major, major and minor releases of Linux. So you'd think that like, this is fantastic. We finally have this, the workflow systems have provenance. Everybody has provenance. We're going to see lots of provenance applications. Yeah, not so much. People don't care about provenance. They'll tell you they do, but it's kind of like security. They want it, but they don't want to pay for it. In this case, paying for it meant running software they weren't comfortable with and or paying overhead. The other problem is that provenance in general is not useful. The moment you start to build an application that uses provenance, you realize that, oh, there's some semantic information unique to my situation that I need. And no system captures exactly that. And I think ultimately the reality is that provenance is like insurance. You don't know you want it until it's too late, right? So I come back to the software for which I submitted a paper six months ago, and the reviewers want just a few more experiments. And so I build my software and it doesn't work anymore. I am sure that no one listening to this talk has ever had that experience, but, but I promise you it happens sometime. And that's the moment when you say like, oh my god what's changed and that's when you want your data provenance so i suggested that perhaps we're giving them the wrong thing why don't people want to use provenance well the answer is it's kind of like big and bulky and slow and in general we the provenance community had been giving them something more like cod liver oil like take this stuff it's good for you and i thought instead of doing that what if we could give them candy you know Hey, try this, it's really good, you might like it. So what would that look like from a data provenance perspective? Well, to answer that question, let's look at the provenance ecosystem, like all the different kinds of provenance. So we started with database provenance, and while all the reasonable people went off and built workflow provenance, we fringe lunatics went off and built whole system provenance. Now, as we were looking at whole system provenance and wanting to build things, we also discovered that sometimes having semantic information at the application layer was useful. And so we thought application specific provenance would be really handy and we could integrate it and it'd all be good. And as we started doing that, we realized that actually we needed both application level provenance, but also language level provenance. So we have this ecosystem of different kinds of provenance collection systems. We know how to link them together. And once you can link them together, you can start to think about interesting applications. So at the systems level, you can build intrusion detection systems on top of data provenance. If you look at sort of the confluence of workflow systems and applications and languages, you can build like a cloud-based workflow orchestration system. So one of my former system students built a system called Starflow that did that for Python applications. Um, if you look at sort of workflow provenance and language provenance, you can start to build containerization solutions. So data scientist says, here's my data, build me a container that will now run forever. And you can do stuff like that. We also have built some tools about program comprehension. So again, I'm sure none of you have ever, ever experienced this one. You're a new graduate student, you show up and your advisor says, oh, here's the project your predecessor worked on. Could you take that and just change a few things? And there you are with thousands or tens of thousands of lines of, excuse the expression, grad student code, and you're trying to figure out what it does. Wouldn't you like a tool that helped you with that? And then finally, we've been working in language level provenance where we build tools to help data scientists. So here is a summary of like everything my script does. Hey, if you capture provenance, I can give you a debugger with the single feature I have wanted since the beginning of programming, which is, could you unexecute that last instruction? Like just step one step back so I can figure out why my program blew up. And most recently, I've been talking with folks from our business school who do supply chain management, as well as people who do mining and energy harvesting. And it turns out that they have a real data problem and data provenance is in fact a solution. So, you know, when you get a raw material like cobalt, it is sometimes useful to know whether it was extracted in a sustainable manner, in an ethical manner, et cetera. And that's basically a data provenance issue. 
So this is just starting up and is super exciting. So what do I take away from this experience? First of all, I think it's okay to be the fringe lunatic. The other side is that research should be serendipitous. If you know exactly the straight line path from where you're starting to where you're going, I'm not sure how much research is actually being done. You know, so we started hacking a storage system and we ended up, you know, getting our fingers in interpreters and cloud systems and graph storage and graph processing and graph query languages and, and sort of all sorts of different areas. But in my mind, that, that's the reason you do research. Now, this is almost a marketing issue, right? If no one is adopting your research and really building upon it, you need to figure out why. And I think as academics and as researchers, we often think that marketing is a dirty word, but it's not, right? Writing papers is a form of marketing. Giving talks is a form of marketing. So we accept that those are okay. Actually looking at your research and figuring out what it will take for someone to adopt it, that's okay too. And so I want to encourage you to think about your work that way. So that wraps up vignette one. This was Providence Aware Storage Systems, about a 20 year history of a field and how it changed. And the fact that I think we're actually now starting to see some real applications that use Providence. The next part is going to be something completely different. And this is, you know, what Margot didn't know really changed her research completely. And I like to call this the long road to program synthesis. So it too is a 20 year story, but most of the action from me is in the last five years. So in 1999, Norman Ramsey came to Harvard and he was working on something called C minus minus, which was a retargetable assembly language. And in 2004, David Holland, who was a research staff programmer with me said, you know, Norman's doing this cool stuff where he takes descriptions of machines and uses those to build tools like assemblers and debuggers or compilers. We thought that's pretty cool. And then we started brainstorming with Ada Lem and we thought, imagine that you could take those descriptions and not only build these tools, but what if you could build like an entire operating system on a machine description and the virtual machine on which it runs. Then what you could do, instead of living in this x86 monoculture that we live in, when you deploy your virtual machines on the cloud, you could create a unique architecture for every instance on the cloud, run an operating system, and you would suddenly make it harder for the hackers to break in because they couldn't exploit the exact same bugs on every platform. Now, there would probably be some commonalities, but the idea was that this diversity of hardware had actually been a plus from a security standpoint at one point. And as we converged on x86, it started to become a problem. So that was way back in 2005. And then this was dormant for a long time because like who was gonna support us to build an operating system that you could synthesize on like fake virtual machines? People didn't think that was interesting. And then in 2015, DARPA launched the BRASS program. And I saw this and I thought, oh my God, this is what we've been waiting for. Now, and DARPA had no idea that this is what they've been waiting for. Right? Here's how they described the program. Right? An evolving ecosystem requires mechanisms to infer the impact of such evolution on application behavior and performance. So this is all about applications. And then they wanted to trigger transformations in applications as the situation changed. So what they're thinking of is you've got an unmanned vehicle, it's on a mission, and somehow the mission changes and you want to change it. They were not thinking, oh, here's a new piece of hardware. You want to synthesize a whole new software stack for it, right? You know, extract whole system specifications. We were going to write specifications. We were going to extract them. You know, leverage new programming abstractions, program analyses, and compilation to correlate application behavior with salient ecosystem changes. If you had stopped after the leverage new programming stuff, maybe that described us, but we certainly weren't doing this other stuff. And then maybe exploit new runtime systems and virtual machine implementations structured to facilitate efficient integration. Maybe. We were still very clearly stretching their definition. But my argument went like this. Many of these systems, like unmanned underwater vehicles, are running really, really, really old hardware. And the reason they're running really, really, really old hardware and really old operating systems is because it is just too hard 
to get a new software stack running. So imagine for a moment that we could solve that problem. That would actually have huge implications. And oddly enough, they bought it. So let's take a look at the BRASS program. Who was working on this program? Well, there were you know, machine learning people. There were more general AI people, people who did planning and probabilistic reasoning and multi-agent systems. And many of the folks in Charles River Analytics who adopted us as their subcontractor, for which I remain extraordinarily grateful, um, you know, that was sort of their focus. But, but they, they bought into our vision and they supported us in it. And I'm enormously grateful. There were lots of PL people. There were roboticists. There were verification folks. And then there was us. And so once again, you know, there we are at the fringes of what's going on. Another way to look at this is here's the BRASS program. Our team was called PRINCESS, which is a brilliant acronym that I did not come up with. And then here was us. And we were, in fact, the fringe lunatics. So here is the story we told at the very beginning. The Charles River Analytics folks were working in the context of unmanned underwater vehicles. So imagine that you have one of these little submarines and lo and behold, you get a brand new computer and you would like to run the submarine on the brand new computer. Now this computer came with a pile of specifications an architecture manual, whatever. And in the old days, you would then sit down and write a port. But in the new world, Instead, you would just write machine description files, which are much shorter. And in a perfect world, I would claim that the vendors would just give these to you when they gave you the hardware. So in addition to the massive architecture manual, which you know is always wrong, you would get a formal specification of the machine. And then the idea was we would build sort of templates for things like assemblers and linkers, and you would take the templates and the machine description files and feed those into a synthesizer, and then you would have all the tools that you need. So you could think of this a little bit like LLVM on steroids, right? With, with a little bit less work at building a new LLVM backend. Now the OS would be written in a fundamentally different way. It's something I call a, a hybrid OS, where you have all the machine independent stuff like you do now. And then the machine dependent stuff is really expressed as a set of specifications of what all the OS pieces have to do. And the idea is that you would take that hybrid OS, you would feed that to an OS synthesizer, and you would get your operating system. And when we started this project, and I, I genuinely believed we were gonna do this, then what we would do is we would take all the princess code that our colleagues were building, which, oh, by the way, ran on a Java virtual machine, and we would be able to rebuild all that with our tools, and then you would be able to run that all on, an op on the operating system we had synthesized. You would then put that all on the little processor and then you would download it into the little submarine and your submarine would go floating away and you would get a hardware upgrade you know, instantaneously. So that was the vision. And I actually thought we would get something that would run. We, we spent a lot of time pretending we were going to support a Java virtual machine. And in retrospect, we should have just abandoned that and said, you know, we are going to take samples that they write in Java, convert them to C, and maybe we can run little C programs. And we eventually got there. But we should have started there. We wasted a whole lot of time because of this JVM issue. Now, this was a grand vision. And part of the problem with this grand vision is that I didn't realize we were actually all doing programming languages. So machine description files, yeah, that's a programming language. This hybrid OS thing, that's a programming language problem. And the thing I really didn't understand is that this synthesis, I was thinking of it as more like fill in the blank templating, but program synthesis had become like a real thing and it was all PL. So suddenly I found myself doing a PL project and thank goodness I had Steve Chong as a collaborator because he actually knows PL and does PL. So that was a big win. And yeah, there was some OS stuff there because we were dealing with source code. So why on earth did I get involved in what turned out to be a programming languages project? Well, I'm gonna claim that the world is changing. So if you take an article on full stack development today and build a cute little word cloud, you get this picture. And I'm gonna propose that in the future you might get this picture, which is really much more about automatically creating real software. And the reason that you do this is because at the end of the day, if you're able to do this, the software you have is verified. And that is hugely exciting because verifying already written code is super hard. Building code where verification is part of the process of building it is way easier. 
So I have not given up on this. We'll come back to where I'm going in the future. So how far did we get? Um, we did not get entire operating systems running, but we did in fact take cases from both OS 161, our teaching OS, as well as Barrelfish. We did four different processors and OS 161 ran on none of those other than MIPS. Barrelfish only ran on two of those. So we actually got parts of the system running on different processors. We had a bunch of different use cases. We had a total of more than 17. These are the ones we evaluated. And we were actually able to synthesize these for lots of different architectures. So we got somewhere. We certainly did not get to the vision that we realized or that we thought we were going to realize. So was this project an unqualified success? No. Was it a research success? Absolutely. We learned a ton about what it really takes to synthesize an operating system. I think we learned a ton about how to build a system that could be synthesized. And you'll see how this plays into my current research agenda. And has it informed this future work? Absolutely. So should we have done this project? Absolutely. Was it totally crazy? Yes. Was I in way over my head? Yes. Was that comfortable? No. Would I do it again? Yes. So what did we learn from all this? One miracle per project. This is motherhood and apple pie. We should have known it. We were banking on lots of miracles. Another one that is motherhood and apple pie that we should have known is to experiment early and often. We spent our first year really learning about the OS we were going to be working with. We learned a lot about synthesis, but we didn't conduct another uh, enough really quick experiments. More project specific, one of the real insights is that machine dependent is different from machine specific. So there are some parts of your system that are machine dependent and you can write a general spec and you can synthesize. There are other parts that are really specific to a machine like the boot sequence. So general synthesis isn't going to work there. We, we think we have some ideas about how we might move forward on that though. So that was one lesson. There's also a, an evaluation criteria, which is how much does it take you to produce a spec and how much value do you get out of it? If the spec is hard to write, then you have to be able to use it in a lot of places and a lot of times to reap the value back. If, however, the spec is really easy to write, then you don't need to be able to use it that many times. So, so as you design structures and languages, this balance is really important to keep in mind. And what this really leads to is an observation that synthesis is a broad class of techniques ranging everywhere from here's a spec, synthesize it, to here's a compiler. And there are lots of intermediate steps and a whole systems approach is gonna require all of those. Now, I probably didn't even know what an SMT solver was when we started this, but the way many of these synthesis techniques work is that you take a synthesis problem, you translate it into input to an SMT solver, and then the solver does amazing things. Now, solvers do do amazing things, but it turns out that how you construct the problems for the solver matters a lot. And so learning how to do that effectively is super important. And then it turns out synthesizing assembly language, which is what this machine dependent code is really about, is really hard for a bunch of scalability reasons. So I just wanna wrap up by saying, this was a huge project. It was a four year effort. We learned a ton, didn't get as far as we wanted, but how has that informed what we're doing next? So I said, okay, one of the lessons is that synthesizing an existing operating system was dumb. And what we should have done is designed our own teeny tiny OS that we could synthesize. So that's now on the agenda. Given that, I decided to broaden the definition of what an operating system is and just think about system software. Because we have all these things like hardware accelerators and little tiny IoT devices and all sorts of other special purpose hardware. And a lot of them have some common features they would like that you could think of as an OS or system software. And maybe that's a target where synthesis would really pay off. So this new project says, let's come up with a library of very, very tiny system components. And when I say tiny, I don't want you to even think at the level of function. I want you to think of as potentially even smaller. And the reason is that synthesis for assembly language still doesn't scale very well. So a bunch of research questions here, like how do we do this? What are these components? How small can we make them? And what do I mean by a component? So when I think about a component, it has like four parts. There's some functionality it needs to do. There's some security properties it better adhere to, right? This is OS code, this is system code. Let's build in the security specification from day one. And then there's gotta be some sort of specification that says, how do I use this component? 
Also, if you want to do things like monitoring and auditing, yeah, better have an API that is able to tell you information about the component. So lots of interesting questions here. How do you enforce the security specification and still enable introspection, right? This is in some ways um, an abstraction of what causes things like Spectre and Meltdown bugs. And I think that's a huge problem. I sort of collaborate with programming languages people who have great ideas about how to think about that. But I think that's a really interesting research question in this context as well. And then how do we take these components and actually put them together in interesting ways? At the same time, we still need machine descriptions. And we've learned a bunch about that. And those are the machine dependent parts. And then the picture is that once we've figured out how to describe all this, you take your components, you take your descriptions, you feed them to a synthesis engine, and now you get implementations of these components. So you start out with specifications, you eventually get to implementations, and there are lots of questions there. Like, can we build these components such that we can synthesize them? And can we then synthesize the higher level constructs? This project is called Velocity for a reason that I won't go into right now, and it's spelled that way. And the two projects that we're looking at right now are both, I think, kind of cool. So one is, let's imagine that we have IoT devices, and we would like to be able to assemble the system software or operating system for these devices such that you could have exactly what you need for each device what are the components we would need? And so we started defining a set of teeny tiny components that we're now almost on the verge of being able to put together to satisfy lots of different IoT kinds of demands. The other one is more of the synthesis in action, which is, can we build teeny distributed systems? So the idea is that we have a Unity specification language. This is not the graphics library, but a different thing. And we then take those specifications, and right now we can synthesize both Verilog, so down to the hardware, or Arduino. And we can, we're, we're on the verge of writing interesting programs that can let you take a set of these little Arduino devices and talk to each other and implement something cool as like in a distributed algorithm. You know, I'll kind of leave it at that. So that's what we're working on. If you want to collaborate, holler. I think it's really fun. And as I sort of think about the message that I really want to go away with, I am inspired um, by a character from my children's youth. So for those of you who grew up with Magic School Bus, in the words of Ms. Frizzle, take chances. Make mistakes. If you're not making mistakes, you're not doing research. And get messy. Get into areas that you're unfamiliar with, right? Have negative results that lead you to even better positive results. On that note, allow me to thank all the wonderful creative people on the internet who put images out that allow me to make talks that are mostly pictures and not words. And a special call out to all of my collaborators. There are many of them, not only my students, but people from other schools, my former Harvard colleagues, my UBC colleagues. I think research and systems in particular is a team effort. And I love collaborating with people who know lots of things that I don't. Um, as I mentioned earlier, an extra thanks to Charles River Analytics for let us taking on a project that no one else would let us do. Of course, there were the funding agencies that provided funding. How many of you in the audience actually remember Sun Microsystems? Um, and even a thank you out to all the critics and naysayers and the harsh reviewers who pushed us to work even harder. And on that note, I am happy to take questions or do whatever the session chairs tell me to do. Thanks, Margo. Uh, that was fantastic. Some really cool stuff. Um, we do have some questions. And uh, the way I'd like to do this is I'm asking people to put your hands up, uh, raise, just, uh, you know, walk over to the virtual microphone by clicking that raise hand button in your Zoom webinar window. Um, introduce yourself and go ahead and uh, start the questions. Uh, we have our first question from uh, Yara Awad, whose uh, name I'm almost certainly mispronouncing, and I apologize. Uh, so I've just uh, passed permission to talk. Yara, you're going to have to uh, unmute. Hello. And there you go. All right. You're on. Hi. First of all, thank you, Margo. This was really absolutely an amazing talk. I loved it from the first two slides. Um, <laughs> 
I just wanted, I had two small questions. Um, you mentioned something about challenges that you faced when trying to synthesize code that would run on top of JVM. Can you say a little bit more about that? Ah, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Not, we weren't trying to synthesize code on oh. top of the JVM. We were trying to synthesize an operating system that would be capable of running a JVM. I see. And so that meant that we had to have like a really full-blown, fully functional system. And yeah, that was, well, that was just kind of silly. Yeah. All right, that's tough. And then um, I guess my second question was, um, could you say a little bit more about um, how assembly does not, uh, synthesis does not scale well? Yeah, so it turns out that most of program synthesis has been done in the context of functional languages. And I now understand yeah. that much better why. So the problem with assembly is that everything is global. So you can't sort of limit state very well. Mm -hmm. And there are no types. So um, there's a lot of both synthesis techniques and error checking and things you can eliminate when you have types. And in fact, in this um, Arduino synthesis project, one of the things that my student has been doing over the last several months is sort of introducing a miniature type system specifically to allow us to scale the synthesis to problems that were too hard without it. And so in assembly language, um, you know, in retrospect, maybe we should have been building on tall and but it took us a while to get to the point where it's like oh this really is hard and then the final point is that every time your program gets one you know so so let's see so the search space is exponential in things like the number of registers the number of memory locations etc yeah. and then it's factorial in the number of instructions and that just grows really really quickly yeah how about if there is like some form of correlation between the data and code? Like if some yeah. way uh, executable images are redesigned in a way that sort of places things based on locality, would that make things easier? Yeah, so, so that's very similar to some of the techniques we've done, which is that, um, you know, we've sort of defined tiny memory regions to address yeah. some of this and that helps. We've also um, relied on some deductive synthesis techniques that let us bound the space we come up with framing constraints. Um, and, and one of my students is actually working on interactive synthesis, which seems oh. really strange in the concept context of assembly language. But turns out that there are not a lot of sophisticated assembly language programmers for lots of hardware. But people yeah. at least who've been trained like have a, a sense of what they want the assembly to do. And so the collaboration between a synthesis engine and a person actually seems to be something that might help us too. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. Well, thank you so much. I don't want to take too much time from other people. Great questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks. Um, I'm going to call uh, Ada uh, to ask her question next. Thank you. I cannot raise, uh, raise a hand as a, as a co-host. Uh, thank you, Margo, for, for the talk. I really enjoyed that. Um, I, I love the, uh, the discussion about synthesis and some of the opportunities and limits and, and, and ways to approach it. And I keep thinking about this older project from Cornell Ensemble. Um, I don't know if you remember it. Vaguely, um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, 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 then, so then maybe if, if you don't remember it well, then, then, then maybe you should look at it again. Uh, it, it's from about 20 something years ago. It's about protocol synthesis. And my question was going to be, that older work that look at automating the process of, of generating protocols, how does that relate? How, how does the you know, broader goal of generating automatically, synthesizing automatically system software, how, does, how is that different or what are some of the unique challenges? And, but if you don't remember that project, then, then perhaps it's, it's harder to give an answer. I don't know. Yeah, so I think I can't answer that. I'm a little embarrassed that it sounds like it's a project I should know about. It's certainly possible that my collaborators do and I don't, but um, thank you for the tip. And it seems like a great piece of work that I at least need to sink my head back into. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um... I'm a little out of order here. I'm going to pop back up to the to the order that things have come in on. And the next uh, the next person on the list is Emer Vifusen. 
uh, again, I apologize about the names. Um, Thank you. Imer, go ahead. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for the uh, compelling and insightful talk, Margaret. That was great. Um, when you're looking at these big and bold ideas, can you speak to this natural inclination of skepticism and constraints, like in the both of cases of provenance and synthesis, like about efficiency and performance optimization? Like when we're brainstorming about these ideas or when we're reviewing papers and grants, at what point should we suspend belief and just turn off this skeptic that might be constraining us in that domain? So I think that is the million dollar question. So I think, I think that there is a, um, I do some screen optimization. So you can think about a linear function, right? And you could think of that some of the terms of that function are novelty, you know, potential impact, feasibility, performance, and, and maybe some others. And then you can assign a weight to each of those. And I feel like, and, and I'm going to get endless grief for this, but I feel like our community has put a really, really big coefficient on performance because it's really easy to look at numbers and decide which is better. And we've put a teeny, teeny, tiny, like, like novelty is almost like a checkbox. Is this new? Is this not new? Check. But we don't seem to, so, so, so that one's more of a binary variable and, and its weight is very low, right? It's like you have to be somewhat novel in order to get um, considered, and then we sort of ignore the magnitude of that novelty. And I feel like we need to fix the coefficients a little bit. And I think if we can be intentional and thoughtful about it and, and comfortable with the fact that we might make a mistake, right? So it should be okay for our program committee to accept a paper and that 10 years from now, when we give it the test of time award, you could look back and say, oops, that one turned out not to be a good idea. Like, I think that's okay. Particularly if it's gonna take a decade to figure out whether it was a bad idea, it meant that there was a ton of learning that went on in there. So as a reviewer, I really try to decouple um, those criteria and I, I try to give weight to all of them because you know, it may be that, that the way we're doing something is a bad idea but that by doing it that way, you spur somebody else to do it better. And ultimately 10 years from now, it's not that original work that gets the test of time award, but we realize that there has been a big accomplishment. And I, I feel like as a community, we've become really, really constrained into what we accept. And you know, I had an example recently where my reading group was reading a paper. We thought the ideas in the paper were super exciting and the whole group, whether they were working in the area or not, was really excited about it. And we wanted to know so much more. And yet the paper was about one third, here's our system. And there were lots of open questions and then two thirds and here's all the performance. And in our discussion, it was like, I don't care at all about the performance. I really want to understand the richness of these ideas and how you're doing things and how they apply. And um, we hypothesized based on some, some forensic analysis that in fact, the authors had tried to publish the big ideas, failed, and had to add all the performance numbers to do that. And so, so I actually checked with the authors, and in fact, that does seem to be what happened. And I would have loved to see that paper a year or two earlier that really talked about those ideas without a line of performance analysis. Now, that's just me, and I don't speak for everyone, but I guess I feel like, you know, somebody who did performance for like the first decade of my career, I get it. Right? It's not like I'm opposed to that, but I feel like the pendulum has just swung too far. I love that. Thank you. All right. So the, the next person in line at the virtual microphone is Arez. So Arez, if you want to go ahead. Oh, and actually, before you do that, uh, somebody mentioned, uh, Margo, if we're not using the slides, if you want to stop sharing, we'll be able to see you better. Oh, yeah, actually, I would love to do that because I can and do lots of things. So let me do that. Give me a second. Uh, come back, stop sharing, because now I think what I can also do is close my laptop and actually look at you all head on. Assuming it Yay. works. I'm waiting for Hey, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Arez. Okay, um, I got one for both, I guess, the junior and the senior, which is, um, do you find that with time, seniority, and experience, the hit rate or rejection rate gets any better? 
Um, and uh, is it any easier <laughs> to digest? So um, I don't think the hit rate gets any easier or gets any better. In terms of digesting, I think it does for me. I think it doesn't for my students. Rejections are really, really hard. Um, so, so I will, I will share with all of you how I tell people to read reviews. Um, you read them and then you put them away because they hurt, right? You put them away for 24, 48, 72 hours, a day or two. Then you come back and you look at them and you make the assumption that the reviewer is on your side and is trying to help you do better next time. And so you try to change your um, read from, you know, I don't know if anybody else does this, but my first read is, that reviewer is an idiot, <laughs> to my second read, which is, what didn't I explain adequately to this reviewer? And how could I do that better? It's not easy. It's totally not easy. And, and I have, you know, every rejection still hurts. Um, I think the way, you know, I make up in quantity, I, I did the stupid thing of making a list of all my ongoing projects. And part of this is because I have this mandate here to really build up a systems group. And so I've tried to do a lot of stuff and that's a little too much maybe, but, um, you know, especially I think for a student who like, this is my thesis work, it's super hard. Um, and I wish I could wave a wand and make it easier, but I don't have said wand. So yes, I still get rejected all the time. Is it a little easier now? Yeah, it's probably a little easier. Um, but I got plenty rejected early on too. And um, you know, you just have to do what you believe and, and it's really hard. And so, you know, open invitation, next time anybody here gets a rejection and you need that pep talk, send me an email, we'll have the pep talk. Um, and that's what your advisor should be doing, right? If you're the advisor, even if you're really bummed, your job is to give the pep talk and remind the student that it's not a personal indictment on them, right? It's like, okay, we must have done something wrong in how we presented this and therefore we can fix it. As opposed to like, I'm a terrible researcher. And I think if we can shift the conversation to what can we do to, to, to make this more palatable? And sometimes it means running 59 performance experiments that actually aren't all that valuable. Thank you. I, I think that the sleep on it advice is pretty good, especially for the students. Okay, so next up is Saurabh Begchi. And uh, just a reminder of people, if you could uh, introduce yourselves, uh, say where you're from. Um, I don't have that information on, on the Slack profiles in all cases. And this is also your chance to make sure your name is pronounced correctly. So go ahead. Uh, hi, this is Saurabh Bakshi. I'm a faculty at Purdue University. Uh, have seen enough number of rejections in my time and completely buy into that idea of giving the pep talk to the students. Uh, I think it really matters to them. But coming to my question, how long do you give yourself to realize that you've made a mistake on a project and presumably you want to do course correction at that point. And, and when you do realize that, do you feel that your students have been delayed in their graduation plans and in their internship plans, what have you, as a result of the mistake? That's a great question. So I don't feel like it has derailed them in terms of overall career. Um, you know, in some sense, if the project fails in some way or parts of it don't work out, that is an opportunity to really dig in and say, okay, why didn't it work out? And what have we learned that leads to something that I can then build on? You know, so let me be clear, we had lots of synthesis approaches that like didn't work and we changed course the horses in midstream and, and we made lots of changes all along. Um, and actually I didn't tell the whole provenance story. I abandoned provenance for many years because I was so frustrated by the fact that the community was focusing only on collection and storage when in fact applications were, it was obvious to me that applications were the way to go. So it's okay to quit areas and come back to them. Now the students can't do that. So I think for the student's point of view, it's really what have we learned that we can then turn into another area. So let me offer a concrete example. I had one student who was involved in the provenance project, but um, 
you know, it sort of didn't feel like it was going anywhere for him. We were doing a bunch of performance analysis and that was not interesting. And so he latched on to the graph structured data and said, you know, there's this really rich data and we've been claiming that you can extract semantic information from our provenance, but I actually want to really understand what that means. And so he ended up doing what I still think of as a brilliant thesis about graph structured data and analysis and all sorts of interesting things. He graduated a couple of years ago and we're actually only now getting around to publishing the work because he went into industry and that wasn't his priority. So I think we always learn something that can push us in a direction that lets us get interesting work out there. And that maybe that's really the strategy to help the students get through this. Got it, thank you, Margo. Thank you. Uh, next up is Eric Eid from uh, Utah, I believe. I'll let Eric introduce himself. Hey, Eric. I can find the right button here. Okay, Eric, you can unmute yourself. Hi. It, I, oh, it says, it tells me I'm talking now. So, yeah, so uh, this is Eric Eide from the University of Utah. It's a real pleasure to see your talk all the way from Salt Lake City. Uh, anyway, my, my question was, when you put up your slide about what is a component and you put that introspection API on the side, that reminded me of work that Gregor Kixalis and Gail Murphy and other people did way back in the late 90s about open implementation. Yep. And I was just wondering uh, if there was a direct connection there. So there is and there isn't. Um, the word introspection, I actually learned from Gregor about 20 some odd years ago at what was then called WOWAS, which we think of as HADOS. So um, I do trace it directly back to Gregor. Gregor now sits next to me. Um, so that's kind of a cool full circle. Um, the idea in the, it, the, the reason it sort of comes into my concepts of OS design come from two places. So one is, um, and I've now forgotten the second one. One is really this notion of how we avoid specter and meltdown kinds of bugs. Oh, I'm sorry, the first one is provenance, right? And that I want that introspection so that I can actually build provenance in as a first class thing from day one. So that was where it came from. But at the same time, my belief, and, and like I said, this is actually really, really deep PLE work that I'm not capable of doing. And so I have managed to convince one of my colleagues that it's an interesting enough problem that, that he's actually got a student working on it. So my belief is that the fundamental thing that underlies Spectre and Meltdown bugs are places where our interface claims to reveal all the information about a component or a chip or something, but the implementation actually reveals different information and usually a larger amount of information. And so that the fundamental challenge of this whole class of bugs is being able to map those two things together so that you can identify where the possibilities of these kinds of bugs are, which I would claim is a precursor to being able to get rid of them. So my hope is that if we do this right and actually have a formal specification of all the information that can possibly escape from a component, that we might be able to do that analysis more easily than we can sort of going back after the fact. So it's kind of a long-term speculative thing for that. The shorter term is really about um, full system provenance and being able to track what's happening inside a computation. But yeah, the intellectual heritage absolutely goes back to Gregor. And it's actually really cool to be in a place where I have Gregor and Gal as colleagues and we, I've come to have totally changed my perception of software engineering in a really positive direction. Um, and that's been great. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, next we have a question from Sarush uh, Batani. Uh, Sarush, you can unmute. Uh, yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so my name is Sarush, I'm a PhD student at UT Dallas. Uh, so uh, great talk. Thank you so much. Very insightful. Uh, one thing about uh, synthesis, because uh, I deal with GPUs, uh, the thing about GPUs is that their development is into in high gear. So every generation, the bytecode, the microarchitecture changes. So yep. the thing that NVIDIA, for example, does is there's a tiny uh, virtual machine like architecture, like 
uh, inside the GPU actually. So instead of just talking using assembly to the GPU, you use a higher level language like PTX. So kind of instead of just thinking about the software producing assembly, the software actually produces a higher level language and then the architecture is responsible for it. So have you thought about something like that for your problem? So, so GPUs are um, one of the more complicated kinds of accelerators that I think about. And so I think what you're suggesting is exactly the right way to go, right? We have not started looking at that particular problem. I invite anybody who wants to, like I would be excited to hear about it, but we have not tackled it yet because I'm trying to focus on accelerators that are even more simple than GPUs. Because GPUs are actually really complicated and describing how their memory works is really hard. So um, we didn't feel prepared to tackle that just now, which might sound odd given you know where we started, but I, I'd like to feel I'm a little bit smarter than I was seven years ago. <laughs> and so I'm trying to apply that. But I think somebody who really knows a lot about GPUs, I think there's huge potential there and it'd be exciting. Okay, thanks. Oh, who's this next guy we're gonna let talk? <laughs> the next up would be Keith Smith. Uh, Keith, go good. ahead. <laughs> hey, Margo. I enjoyed Hello. the talk. Um, so you talked about the um, coefficients of your equation for how we accept papers. Um, I'm sort of interested in a different aspect of the challenge of getting your big ideas published and out there, which is the 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 jigsaw puzzle you presented at the beginning of the of the talk, right? You're, you describe these things that, that check a lot of those boxes. So what was your experience like in terms of trying to find homes for those or get, you know, the different venues to accept them and are there things we should be doing we as a community should be doing differently to try to make it easier for projects like that to get out there so that's a great question so you know i'm old enough that many of these specialized venues didn't exist and one of the things i always loved about atc is that it was a broad tent right and and over the years we've come to describe it as a broad tent and then once an area coalesces, then we spawn it off into its own area and i, I get that because there's this competing pressure between giving people a venue in which to publish and keeping the communities talking to each other. So, um, so it's a hard problem. Um, you know, I know that at SOSP last year, there was discussion about holding it more often. You know, I think the bottom line is that we are not doing ourselves a service by publishing you know, however many papers we publish in a year in systems, even if you add all the conferences together, when you compare it to, you know, what the ML guys are doing. So, so we, we have a, we, we rate limit publications and systems in a way that is not super productive, I think. Now, the ML folks have a different problem and, and I'm not gonna try to solve that because that's not my community. Um, so I think the question is how do we unthrottle the publication rate without, you know, and I don't want to say lowering the bar, but, but, you know, how do we, how do we release the creativity, get stuff out there and still have a vetting process that, you know, gives stars of approval. So I think one of the things that I've seen more conferences do, and, and I think this is probably in the right direction is the, look, we're not going to accept the paper this year, but if you fix it up and do some stuff, we'll actually have the same reviewers look at it. Mm -hmm. and, and give you an answer. Like, I think that's a great idea. So, you know, I had that happen with the Usenix security paper. Um, so I think that kind of model is helpful and productive. You know, it's, it's a little ironic that when we're assembling a program committee, so I just did Eurosys, and it's really important that we get people with all sorts of expertise, and we do that, and we try to get broad coverage, and yet the individual papers tend to be like, oh, this is a PL paper. And, and so we accept papers from different areas, but we rarely accept papers that are really interdisciplinary. And part of that is that they're really hard to review, right? And so I'm sure many of you have been on program committees where the question is, you know, you have a paper that is a user study of a security property on a system. And so you're reviewing it from a system. So it's like, well, was this a bad HCI paper that got rejected? No, no, it was a bad security. And I think we just need to stop doing that. I think we need to be able to look at things holistically and say, does this make a contribution to our community? And is it not just a rehash of something that is well known in another community? So you have probably heard me whine about this before, but um, we don't read broadly. Okay, so it's hard to keep up with everything. I'm not trying to make more work, 
but the reality is that most of us tend to read from a very narrow community. And I don't have a great solution for that because like bandwidth is limited. But, um, you know, one of the things that I did when I got BBC is like I started not too many. I tried to do too many and I cut it back, but, but I actually try to go to reading groups that are not system B. So mm -hmm. program analysis was my big, you know, it's like, oh, I should learn more about this because this will help in synthesis and stuff. So, so I think, um, you know, if Andrew Collier, so everyone here should be subscribed to the morning paper. Um, Andrew Collier is not a computer scientist, but he writes at least three papers a week and writes fabulous blog posts on them. And he sits down and he actually learns stuff. So if he can do that with his full-time job, then we can do that too. And so I want us all to aspire to be better Andrew Colliers and, and do more of that. And I think if we all did that, we would slowly start to change it. Sounds great, thank you. It's kind of hand wavy, but you're used <laughs> to that for me. Okay, our next question is from George Ambrosiadis. Uh, go ahead, George. Thank you, Angela. Um, hi, Margo. I'm George from CMU, and this was a really inspiring talk. Thank you for this. Um, and actually, my question is related to what Keith asked you. Um, it's one of the trends I've been seeing in sort of the incoming pools of grad students is that there's a fascination with machine learning specifically. Um, and what I wanted to ask you, but I have no problem with like an area seeing a lot of interest, right? But um, you showed this sort of puzzle of multiple pieces and we've made a lot of progress on those and now we need to sort of stitch them back together and solve even bigger problems. And so that requires a lot of effort. So how do we motivate new students and what do we need to do as a community to kind of draw more people in? That's a great question. I, I too am envious of the number of applicants that my ML colleagues get. Um, so, so one of the things I do is one of the topic areas I list that I'm interested in is ML is applied to systems because I think there are 150 different areas in which we can apply machine learning to systems. And so I do start to see students who are interested in that. The other reality is that, you know, the reason students tick off machine learning now is because they know it's hot and they will get jobs. So I think after they land at your university, you can also recruit them. Um, and it turns out, and this might feel disingenuous and I don't mean it to be that way, but, but first year graduate students don't know by looking at a systems project what's hard and what's not hard, right? So, so you can put out ideas that you know are not the level of a first year graduate student is gonna tackle, but that are exciting and bold and that have enough of these buzzwords and are, are sort of attractive that people might do them. You know, and then you treat them like your own students and you sort of bring them up to speed on smaller problems, but, but you sort of paint this big picture that makes our area feel as exciting as the machine learning area. And, and I don't mean that to be like fiction. I mean reality, right? So, so we're not at a point yet where full stack developer is all about specifications and synthesis and verification, but we could be. And that's gonna attract a bunch of people who are not necessarily interested in systems. So, so I think, you know, as it gets back to marketing a little bit and, and how you describe the kinds of problems you want to solve. Um, but, you know, yeah, my ML colleagues still get, you know, 5x the applicants that I get. Makes sense. Thanks. Okay, so the, the last question that we have here uh, is coming from Umesh Mahushwari. And I'm just going to read the question. He's, he says he's got some background noise issues there. So I'm going to read the question for him. Uh, Umesh says, thanks for raising some important questions about the nature of research. As a follow-up question to your response to Emer regarding the need to reduce the weight on performance analysis, I agree with you very much. There is too much weight on empirical performance analysis and too little on conceptual analysis. The problem with this current state is that researchers have a strong incentive to hack the performance analysis of their own work, for example, by cherry picking results, and the performance results might not be transferable to other contexts. Conceptual analysis might be more resilient to change of context and might enable researchers to publish without having an army of collaborators to implement the full system. One possibility is that we change the call for papers for authors to either propose a new concept 
or evaluate concepts previously proposed by other researchers. What do you think about this approach? So I agree with absolutely everything in the question, and I'm really intrigued by this approach. Um, it's a really clever idea. I don't know how the community would react. And, you know, in some sense, it would take a really bold program committee to say, yep, we're going to do that this year in a conference. But I, I love this idea of saying we have two types of papers, right? One is a new idea. Um, and I, I think the key to making this work is to give both the authors and the reviewers a, a framework or excuse me, a grading rubric in which to evaluate new ideas. And if we could do that, then I think you could make this work. Because I, I do feel that one of the things that holds us back is that you know, we think it's easy to evaluate performance, but as you point out, it's really easy for us to get snowed too. Completely agree with that. And if we could figure out how to help both authors and reviewers, so authors know that, yeah, you actually have done something that, that seems appropriate, and reviewers to figure out how to evaluate and compare things, I think you could really make this work. Off the top of my head, I don't know what that rubric looks like, but working on that seems like a really great thing to do. Right. So that, that was a that's a great question. Umesh just added a follow up to let us know that the approach he proposed there is followed by some economists. So maybe that's a community that we could look to for some uh, some insights on how to make this work. Well, it, and, and, it's definitely and, hard to push program committees to change what they think is a is an acceptable paper. Yeah. Uh, coincidentally, I actually. Um, for bizarre reasons, got invited to, to drop into EC, which is the e-commerce um, conference, which is exactly the place where computer scientists meet economists. And so I'm probably going to pop in there later this afternoon and, and perhaps um, actually try to figure out what they do, because this seems really interesting. Uh, great opportunity. Uh, so this is uh, 3.15 now. So uh, according to the schedule, we're, we're at time. Um, and we've also exhausted the, the list of questions. If you had a minute to, to stay, I had one question I wanted to ask you myself. Sure. Uh, which is, um, you know, there's, there's this advice about the best time to plant a tree, uh, which is the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. And the second best time is today. And I'm wondering how that translates. You know, is, is there, you know, what's the right time to be a fringe lunatic? Um, yeah, it comes naturally to some of us, I'm afraid. Um, you know, I think, I think it depends what your goals are. So, you know, I went to a place where tenure was anything but assured, and I spent the first seven years of my career saying, okay, let me get this right. They could deny me tenure, and I could go get a job where I make more and work less. Okay. <laughs> so I think I was willing to be more risk taking early on and consistently. Um, and in our field, right, in computer systems, I kind of feel like all of us have that opportunity. And yet we, we hold out like it's got to be, you know, tenure or bust. And, um, you know, if you believe tenure or bust, then I think it's much harder to be really aggressive and, and you know, fringe lunatic. Um, but if you're willing to say like, hey, like there's lots of jobs out there and I could probably have better work-life balance, um, then I think you can do it anytime, right? And, and, and also fringe lunatic ideas won't come to you all the time. So in some sense, the right time is when you have them. And, and, and it's always, it's also not clear. Like I didn't realize what fringe lunatics we were going to be in past. I kind of realized it in the, the brass project, totally. Um, but in past, I didn't realize that the community that I was going to want to talk to was this other community that I really didn't know about and that they were going to think of us as fringe lunatics, right? The systems people thought we were totally normal. Um, and the fact that we now have whole system provenance and we have network, pro like, like in my mind, that's really cool. Like the systems community said, oh, that's a good idea. We should do it. So I was never a fringe lunatic in that community. It was just sort of the other community that I ended up in. We need to talk more about the fringe lunatic projects that don't end up being adopted uh, and, and broadly successful. Uh, well, but, and you also get to define your own success. Like I'm sure other people would look at past and go, eh, 
you know, not successful. I think it was a hugely successful project in a bunch of ways, but, but that's my bias. Well, thanks again, Margo, for a really inspiring talk. There's uh, lots of comments on the Slack. I, I know this is uh, some really interesting projects and some great advice for systems researchers. Uh, so thank great. you for joining us. Um, I, I know the, uh, I believe the video presentation is going to be available later. Yeah. The Slack channels uh, stick around. Uh, maybe some of these conversations can be continued. That'd be great. And I just want to add one note. So when I was given the award last year, my closing remarks were next year, when you come to this event, whether virtually or in person, bring someone with you who doesn't look like us. And I just want to re-echo that sentiment. We have a problem in our field. Each of us has a responsibility to do better. And I just want to ask everybody to do that. Thank you, Margo. Thanks, everybody. See you on Slack. <laughs>